As we continue the season of celebration, I feel like we have the individual that we are celebrating the most uh, as far as the season of celebration is Carissa Riley from our rowing team. And that would be because MVP, uh, Howard Ferguson Award, Jones Trophy, Purple Blanket. Were, how big is that trophy case getting in the house? Or is it like a parent's thing where they just take everything and it goes back to the family house? Well, I mean, I'm from Calgary, so, and I'm graduating, so I'm moving all my stuff home because I'll be moving out to the National Training Center. Uh, so I just mailed a massive box of everything home a couple of days ago. Uh, so that's that was fun, but I'm not really sure where it's going to go because, I mean, in rowing, you get a lot of, like, medals and stuff, but uh, I only started rowing, like, five years ago, so... I don't really have any trophies on a trophy shelf or anything. I think my parents will be a bit shocked when they open this box that I sent home. <laughs> what? They're, they're expecting just, you know, run of the mill things from the house, you know, some, some, you know, things from your room, a living room, a, you, know, a, you know, a lamp or something like that. They open it up and they're like, okay, where do we put all this? So um, that being said, how, how, how exciting was it for you for that? Like, uh, I'm no, knowing you, I'm sure you weren't expecting a multitude of things, but that was a pretty big day at the awards. Did you feel like you were just constantly like in a circle that you were like, up I go on stage, now I come back and sit down, now I'm going back up again? Did it feel a little bit like that? It was a little bit like that. I think one of my teammates was like, you didn't sit down for more than 25 minutes in that two and a half hour long thing. <laughs> I was like, well, fair enough. Um, I don't know. It was a little bit surprising. I had kind of known before that I was up for MVP and I had like an inkling that I might be in the running for some of those bigger awards because uh, Bonnie had reached out to me and asked me to put my name in for the Howard Ferguson. But honestly, I like, well, I mean, I do my best in my academics and my athletics, but I've, was, I'm sure there's someone else that's way more like fitting for this award. <laughs> but pretty shocking because obviously Howard Ferguson Award, first time it's been handed out at the athletic banquet so uh or the athletic gala so i was a little bit shocked to you know start off the afternoon with that because one i wasn't expecting to be receiving it at that point or receiving it at all so a little bit a little bit shocked there and then uh obviously mvp my coach had told me beforehand so it was a little bit of a little bit less um of an expectation there and then um I don't know, the major awards were just kind of standing on stage like, oh, my God, am I going to win this? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I have a, I have a nice series of photos that because uh, for, for those who don't know, the Purple Blanket recipients come up. We've got uh, 12 or 13 this year. Uh, everybody comes up on stage. And then from that, you know, traditionally the the Jones and Brown winner come from it. Um, little known secret i kind of know who wins everything beforehand so i know exactly who to point the camera at um that's also why i stand at the back of the room so nobody knows exactly why i'm pointing in certain directions and at times in the past where people have you know complete shock on their face and yours was just kind of like oh cool <laughs> um it, it, it was it didn't knock you over but at the same point you could tell you weren't exactly like standing there going yep this is in the bag i've got this it was kind of like you almost like looked around everybody else and went wow Okay, cool. Um, well, what I'm was that feeling like? I'm standing up there with like, I mean, I've got Elisa, my teammate over there, who like won a silver medal at under 23 Worlds last summer, um, has been a major contributor to the team as well. Um, and then I'm listening to all of these other Purple Blanket winners. I'm like, geez, these guys have impressive resumes. <laughs> like any one of them deserves the um, deserves this award just as much as I do. So I was standing there, I was like, oh, me really? Well, let, 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 I know I know we don't have time to go through the resume because we'd be here for about three hours. Even though you said it's only been a couple of years, but uh, I know we talked back, you know, in, when we talked in the fall about you know how things went for the season. But um, you know, for, have you had that time now? I know there hasn't been a whole lot of time to kind of reflect and look back, but I know you know obviously the rowing season, the the outdoor version, as we talked about, that does not end at a certain point uh, in the winter. Um, you know, have you taken that bit of time to go? Wow, that that was pretty all right sort of thing or, or was it until you were putting the box of things together that you realized exactly how successful maybe the last year and change had been well I kind of think back to uh 2019 was my first year with the team and I had barely started rowing 
So, I mean, I was in the throw, so-and-so throw, so-called throwaway double. So it was the two lowest ranked athletes on the team, just getting the boat down the course. Um, I was three seed in the eight. And for those of you who don't know what three seed in the eight, it's, I mean, I don't like to see it as like, I mean, you still need eight people to row the eight, but it's technically like not the most important seat. It's typically your like lowest ranked athlete that sits there. So um, that's the social taboo, I guess, about it. But so I was the lowest ranked in this eight and in this throwaway double. And I was just happy to be there. I was happy to be part of the varsity team. Um, I was not a good athlete at that point. Um, so it's kind of shocking to see how far I've progressed, I guess, in the last couple of years, because a lot of it was over COVID because we had that gap year uh, in 2020 where I wasn't competing at all, um, just kind of working on my fitness and technical components when I was able to get in the boat. Um, and then I think it was just a big shock to, I mean, in the spring of 2021 i was invited to trial for the under 23 team and then it was i went to under 23s and then i came back to western and i started winning a bunch of things which was funny because the last time i had been competing for western i was the lowest ranked athlete on the team and then all of a sudden i was the highest ranked athlete on the team uh so it was a little bit weird in terms of like learning to develop those leadership skills. Cause all of a sudden you have everybody looking towards you as this like athlete that's supposedly phenomenal. And I'm just like, I've raced 10 regattas in my entire life. Everybody has way more experience than me. Stop looking at me. <laughs> so it was a little bit, um, a little bit funny thinking back on terms of like that progression. And I'm still relatively, I still feel relatively young and young in terms of like my experience level with the sport. Um, in that, like, I've only had I think, three solid years of actually competing going into year four, but I've been rowing for five years. <laughs> so, um, still plenty to learn, still plenty to grow, but it's kind of, I don't know. I find it a little bit I'm like, wow, I did that. <laughs> like a, a little bit like, uh, almost like a little pat on my back, which is not something I struggle with being proud of myself. Um, it's always like. I have this analogy that I use when I'm trying to describe my like sense of achievement. It's more like, okay, if I jump over that high jump, I have to set it to the next level because I can do that. So I might as well like try the next level and I'll just keep raising the bar, raising the bar, raising the bar. So uh, I never really remember that I'm already jumping really high. So there's I'm my... sure the national team people are happy with the fact that you're trying to go that next bar, next bar, next yeah. bar, because, you know, they kind of want that. Um, I, I know in your I was reading through kind of your nomination letter and Matt mentioned that that the whole what you were just talking about, the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity before COVID. You were you were kind of in the OU group that year. You weren't in the CU group. Um, and then he basically just said from the time that the shutdown happens, he said it almost seemed like it was one person was here before and a different person came back after. Were you comparing with teammates about like how much training you were doing? Were you kind of seeing, am I working a little harder than everybody? Like did something just click or what happened there? I don't know if I think back to that. So in the beginning of the shutdown, we were told we weren't allowed to do any intensity workouts um, because they were concerned about our health. So it was all like steady state or cross trains and I was living at home. And then for a while there, I went out and lived with my grandparents and uh, did some road biking on my dad's old mountain bike that was in the shed. Um, this is like rural Manitoba. So I was road biking and on like the side of the highway and mowing lawns and ditches just for something to do because my sisters were still in school because they're both younger than I am, but I was done. So just, you know, mowing ditches and trimming hedges. And I wasn't really like, I was training, but I wasn't training, I guess. And then I kind of was able to come back to Ontario for a couple of months. I wouldn't say that my training was like super intense compared to everybody. I think a really good word to describe it is consistent. Because if I look through my second year, which was all online 2020 slash 2021 season, um, 
yeah, pretty much just making sure I got up and I was training at home once again in Calgary uh, out of my parents' basement alone. That was a fun time, seven and a half months alone. Um, but just like making sure I got up and uh, my the coach for the lightweight women's team, the volunteer coach, Jordan, absolutely incredible. Like was just checking in on me almost three or four times a week, making sure that I, I felt good about my progress. And I, it was just like baby steps, but consistency is the word I'd use to describe it. It's just like showing up, getting up at six in the morning, getting the workout done, going to my part-time job, coming back, doing school, doing a cross train in the afternoon, just like got myself into a schedule and didn't really pay attention to what other people were doing, I guess. It was just, as long as I'm better than the version of myself that I was yesterday, then I'm fine. So, and it's okay to have like, obviously those off days as well. Like you can wake up and just have a bad day because the weather sucks outside or something like that. But uh, just, I think overall maintaining consistency was probably what got me from, I don't know, athlete that was subpar or about average on the team to, I guess, the position that I hold uh, now in my graduating year. So is your message to fellow teammates, if you want to improve, start mowing lawns and ditches and when you're off time and you'll build like, you know, because that's the thing. You look at anybody that's in, you know, works in at landscaping and stuff. Like that, they're usually well-built individuals because, A, that stuff isn't light. And, B, when you have to do it that consistently, away you go. So, um... Well, I mean, I'm five foot six and my grandfather just kind of sent me out with, uh, with the truck and the lawnmowers in the back so I had to learn how to like pull them out of the trap out of the back without like dying on the side of the highway in Manitoba but you know what uh my training was unique at that time point but I think it also helped me learn the value in like I missed my teammates a lot it was really challenging to be like okay I'm gonna go for a 90 minute bike ride and I'm not gonna talk to anybody for 90 minutes um and I don't really have anybody to push myself through these tough sessions because it's just me. So I think, and I wasn't on the water. So I wasn't doing what I wanted to do, which was row. I was biking. So it was more like learning, learning to appreciate like every day I get to go out on the water. I'm lucky to go out on the water because there was a time where I wasn't allowed to go on the water. And every day I get to train with my teammates is a great day because even if I'm out in the single pursuing my own things and they're working on their own things, it's they're around. And that's not something that's always been there. It I spent a whole year without it. So it's <laughs> nice to have them there. And I mean, I, as like my research with my undergrad, uh, focused on teams research, but it's almost like looking into the literature kind of speaks to my personal experience and that like your teammates are such a big motivating factor and people often take, I find they take, um, they don't realize how much, how much of an important role your teammates play in your experience with the sport. And this is with any sport, but rowing can be individual or collective in terms of its sports. Like I can go out and row in the single or I can row in an eight with nine other people in the boat. So or sorry, eight other people, nine people total. So <laughs> like, it's, it's something that's underappreciated. I think the value of your teammates and it's something that I had to, that I learned pretty, uh, pretty early on just because of it, but I only think I'm acknowledging its existence at this point. And it's interesting because as you were kind of saying, that's the interesting thing with a, a, kind of a handful of sports that we have kind of in the university level. But I know with you guys for rowing kind of there, there's there's team sports and I know when it comes to, you know, the, the awards conversation stuff like that it's like, OK, is this a team influenced element? Is this an individual athletic element? You guys have like a bit of everything, especially in times when you can be in a, a as you say, a boat by yourself, you can be a two of you, it can be four, it can be an eight boat. Uh, by the way, also, if anybody hasn't been to a regatta and you think that even though like lakes are long and you can't hear anybody, it's a voice stretch. Like it doesn't matter how far down the lake you are, you you can hear the group uh, cheering you on sort of thing, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, our races are two kilometers long typically. And I have a vivid memory of uh, world champs this past year a little bit outside of the Western group, but world champs have got the men's eights coming down. You can hear them at the start line 
from the finish line and that's two kilometers away it's just insane the no amount of noise that aids make you can just hear them and you can hear the coxie screaming at them to go faster you can hear their calls it just kind of ends up being like a jumbled mesh of like mess of just noise but you can hear them which is just like so you, you can t you know that they can hear you too which is almost an interesting component is like as you're um, approaching the finish line they're getting louder and louder and you need to and obviously you're getting more tired so you need to kind of use that but also not um, not get distracted by it it can be incredibly distracting um, when we race in St. Catharines uh, it's about halfway through the race and we are quite close to where most people stand and watch um, so they can be incredibly distracting standing there if you're like mid-race and you get a little bit distracted because there's someone screaming your name off the side of the side of the course. I, so. ha I have a feeling you have like a couple of names in mind of like, you know, uh, of people who may have been screaming your name specifically that you may, did you go back afterwards and go, all right, that's enough of that. Just, you know, <laughs> yell purple and proud or go Mustangs or something. Gosh. Just leave my name out of it. <laughs> My, my teammates and my coaches think this is hilarious, but apparently I row faster when people say my name. Apparently I'm like an internal narcissist or something, but they discovered that apparently I bring the stroke rate up and uh, go fast. The boat looks like it moves faster when people say my name. I don't hear them say my name because I just kind of like dial in, but it just became a thing where like they yell, Chrissa, go faster! Or something like, like, Chrissa! <laughs> just all of a sudden, just, everything goes faster. <laughs> something like that. Uh, after the awards night, what, what did the phone blow up pretty quickly with, you know, teammates and, and everybody else sending messages? What was the, were there a few sp special messages in there after, after the big, uh, multiple wins? Um, I think one of the ones that stand out would be my 19 year old sister, who's actually like traveling right now. She's out in Europe. She, um, sent me the post from Western Mustangs. I didn't even know she followed it um she's like this is insane thank you thank you by the way to your sister for following our account i appreciate it thank you <laughs> and she like forwards it to me and she's like this is insane I mean, she's not one to like reach out to me um just randomly like that so i mean it was a, it was a little bit funny to hear from that and both my parents were traveling so i couldn't actually get a hold of them till the day afterwards and at that point, they had seen everything on social media. And they're like, Chris, what happened yesterday? Uh, it was random Thursday. It was pretty good, though. Because they had known <laughs> I had actually done some testing in the morning, um, big 2K test for us. And they had known I was pulling that because they typically know my testing schedule. Um, and I also had a bunch of essays due that day and my thesis due a couple of days afterwards. So it was a busy day for me. But... They were, they were, um, my mom was like, okay, oh, how do your tests go? And she, she thought that's why I was calling her. But I mean, the <laughs> test went well. I it got a personal best, but it was just like, I'm not calling to talk about my test results right now. <laughs> now, can you take me through some numeric? Mom, I kind of won like four things yesterday. <laughs> it was like, oh, and that, and that, and that. And then I kept, I actually started getting emails from alumni afterwards uh heather cartwright in particular who is essentially our western rowing historian there she wrote the web history of western mustang uh rowing book and she's like you're the first female athlete to win both and the first athlete to win both in the same year like, what that's insane and like the other people the other person to win was peter mcclellan and he went on to have a really successful international career and is quite prominent as an alumni so I mean I'm kind of joining a little club of a uh, little club of uh I guess how did Matt put it when he was talking about it um I don't know just a special club of just highly recognized people and I didn't I didn't even realize that when I was receiving these I was like oh cool like I'm getting these awards like I didn't really I just tried to be myself and do my best and everything. And then everybody's like, wow, this is so great. I know. <laughs> cool. I've got a couple things I got to get done in the next couple of days, but uh, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Now, you, you talked about the fact that you'd only rode, a, had like a, a little bit of experience of rowing before you came in. What would uh, Carissa now say to Carissa back then about what now is like? Uh, would would the, would the Carissa at the start of the Mustang career kind of go, yeah, whatever? <laughs> uh, I think Carissa in first year was incredibly scared of what was going on. I don't think I was quite ready to move out. I was, what, 18? when I moved out of my house, <laughs> out of home. Um, luckily I got to spend more time at home than you typically do. I think I've only done like 60% of my degree actually here in London. So that's, I mean, the numbers are a little bit off there as compared to your typical university student. But first year, Krista was very scared. Very, very scared. Didn't feel like she belonged. I mean, I came out to Western, I was like, if I don't make the varsity team, then, um, well, then I guess I'll just row recreationally with the London Western Rowing Club because I just like the sport. Like, I was just here to learn. And then it was like, I think I had rowed more in our training camp than I had ever rowed previously. Uh, I was just like, just completely unaware of, I guess, the caliber of team that existed here. And I don't know, if I had to say something to her, I just, you know, tell her that it's all going to be okay. Like you can take a deep breath. Everything's going to be fine. You don't need to stress about it. Maybe, you know, like, like relax a little bit, I guess. Um, remember that like, you're going to get through the next four years. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be some hurdles, some obstacles, but like, take a deep breath. Western is your family. Like as much as you might miss your actual family, um, you can make a home here. And I think I had that conversation with Matt. It was a very traumatic day for me in the single. It was windy and I couldn't control my boat. And I hated, I hated my life at that point. I was stuck in the middle of a lake and I couldn't move. And Matt comes over to like rescue me because I'm like facing the wrong way and I can't spin. Because that was my boat skills when I first started. I couldn't move this boat around. And, and like now I've raced it multiple times internationally, but Matt comes over. He's like, Crystal, what's going on? I'm like, I want to go home. <laughs> My mom had left after moving me into residence. I was like, I can't be here anymore. This sucks. He's like, you know, you have to make, you have to make the best of like, it's up to you to decide that this is what you want to do. And then I think just seeing my teammates operate at that like level and just being super friendly and pushing each other each day in practice. I was like, Hey, Matt's right. I do have to just kind of make my place here. And I think that's a lesson that I've learned a lot throughout my university career. Like when I came back, as like a strong athlete. It was okay. I'm not a natural leader. I'm very much an introvert. I do not like standing in front of crowds, standing and doing a speech uh, at the awards was like the most terrifying thing I've done all year. I consider the start line no problem. <laughs> like standing and talking in front of a group of people is terrifying. I had like, I was like, okay, as long as I don't bring anything because then people will tell and I'm like shaking. <laughs> but um, well, don't trip. That was the other fear. But I think it was learning to create my own like my own type of leadership style and learning that like I don't have to necessarily fit into the mold of what everybody else wants me to do in terms of like I don't have to be this like strong leader captain type thing I can just show up and work hard and like lead by example in a way like I don't have to kind of fit necessarily as a perfect puzzle piece into the mold of like what a leader should be so learning to kind of forge my own path that way was super important. Although I am off my parent, my um, teammates consistently bug me about this, but I am incredibly slow to get on the water. And it's just been like, the, it's the running joke that I like save all my energy to be fast on the water because I am so slow at getting on and off the water. Like I'll spend five minutes on the dock when I don't need to. It's just, I don't know something that I, I guess a quirk that I've developed but it was the do everything that Krissa does except for take a thousand years on the dock when you win as much as you have you just go it's my way and everybody kind of goes mm. 
what are we going to do? Argue with the fact that when she gets results when she gets on the water? So who knows? So, um, I feel like I'm just like gearing up, getting ready to do the session. That's it's a, it's a it's a getting the, getting the mental position zone. It's all about a you know it, it's a planning perspective. You know, trust me, I tell stories for a living. I can I can make them all up for you. So um, I probably me just like chatting with everybody, asking them how their roads were. Like pretty sure that's me just. Like some sort of wild turkey, probably. That's your leadership style. It's more of a communication-based element where you're trying to make sure you interact with everybody sort of thing and then just go out in the water and dominate. It's all good. Um, yes. How many times now in this last year and a bit have you started looking at some of those people that are in the novice group or just the the the, the first year on the varsity group and you're looking and going, have, has some questions or have you kind of, you know, looked and kind of went, wait a second, that person is me from my first year. <laughs> I wouldn't say that there's anybody really on the team right now that reminds me of myself. There was, um, actually, she's in third year now. So uh, she started novice when I wasn't here, but I met her. She's the captain of the lightweights now. Uh, her name is Haley. And she actually comes from a career of kayaking. She did kayaking on the national team. And I can just see the, like that little bit of spark and drive in her that's, uh, that was just kind of there as soon as I was like, oh, I could do this. And so she's super competitive and just wants to improve. She's not really concerned about like eating everybody else. She's more concerned about her own improvement, which is such a skill to develop, such a skill to develop. And then I guess... Um, I guess I see it might a little bit of myself and all of my teammates. I don't really know a lot of like the open weight women or the men's team. Um, but in terms of the lightweights, we've got Haley there and, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Sarah, uh, Sarah Butler for the last two years. She's sat behind me in the four for the past two years and was my double partner this year. And the, uh, substitute double partner while Alex, uh, was injured for a little bit uh, in 2021, but she just, she knows when it's time to work hard. She will show up and like, she knows when it's time to turn on the focus. And like, I know hopping into the boat with me might be a little bit terrifying. I remember the first time we hopped in the boat together was short notice. Uh, we just hopped in the boat and went out to a race. We had never rode together before. Um, and at that point, like, I mean, she's, she, she'll uh, laugh at it now, but she was terrified of me. She's told me that. And I just, I don't see myself as a terrifying person. So it's a little bit, um, I see a little bit of myself in her in that, like, she was scared of me and, but, and the fact that she, like, works hard. But nobody, I guess, that's what's unique about team sport is that I can't find someone that's exactly like me, but I see a lot of people with really, strong character traits and I'm like oh I want to be like that and or like oh I wish I was like that like they just have everybody has their own like I guess benefits that they bring to the team and strengths and I wouldn't want anybody to be exactly like me because if I mean yes we'll joke that if we put four of me in a boat it would go really fast but I honestly don't think that we'd go anywhere because we'd sound, sit there chatting about technique more than anything so uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't actually want anybody to be exactly like me in terms of like everybody should focus on being themselves and that's the best way to progress like being better than you were yesterday and focusing on like being the be best version of yourself as opposed to like mirroring someone else having like the little, the little traits in common. I do see, I do see that in a lot of, a lot of the um, teammates. I, I feel like it's just kind of a, a rite of passage thing that, you know, anytime we're talking rowing, I feel like I can hear Matt and, and Dan saying, give a plug for the novice program. Um, do, do you have the 30 second elevator pitch for, for, for novice just because, yeah. you know, they're always trying to get more people in and the fact that you, if anybody can, come out and learn and kind of progress to, or are they just preparing you for like the billboard now of like, this is Carissa. Here's what she's done. She started with us. We've taught her. Well, yeah. Like, as I think I've mentioned a little while back, like I barely knew how to row when I got to Western, I would say like, I knew the basics of what a rowing boat was. And I kind of understood a 
couple of the concepts, but they kind of taught me everything. Although I was on the varsity team my first year, like I know so many athletes, like a lot, a large portion of our team, by the time they get them, like they get to fourth year, the most competitive people came out of novice. And it's always fun to watch them, I guess, over the past four years, I've gotten to watch a couple different groups of novices come in and just learn and develop and become these great varsity athletes and OUA champions. Um, so yeah, it's like the novice program. It's, it's super fun because the, your novice year, you're in big boats. You get to try, like you get to try some smaller boats. Uh, but you get to go out and race the big boats and it's all just for fun. You get to do weekly ERG competitions with the other universities and then you kind of, it's a unique opportunity in that like rowing's a late development sport and we have such a good program to just turn, if you're even remotely athletic at the beginning of university, you can become a varsity or national or Olympian. even like, if you want to take it that far, like, just got the infrastructure and the coaching knowledge and everything to set people up for success if that's what they want to do and it's a fun program too it's a, such a fun program i'm jealous of what the novices get to do they get to do like fun little workouts and they all show up this past year they all had like matching crocs and like fun out like i think they all wore hats in another year and it's like just just a fun program for the novices and then those who really fall in love with the sport, come and like take it to the next level and become varsity athletes. So I like, I can't say enough about the novice program. I will, I will preach to the choir with Matt and Dan there, but uh, novice program is great. Uh, and finally, what, what's the summer looking like? Cause I know for you last summer was exponentially crazy. I know there's a, a few different elements to this summer and going forward, but uh, how, at what point do, I guess I'm just, going totally selfishly here um how long until i can put the headline mustang in olympics <laughs> so uh the way that like i'm a lightweight so uh the only olympic event is the lightweight double there are currently two athletes that are already in and have been selected i believe i think they're going to be in the double for the world cups because i'm not there to uh, try out for the double I decided to finish my degree. Um, Good on so, you, by the way. <laughs> so my focus right now is uh, training for under 23 worlds, which uh, because I'm 22, I still qualify for that. So that's kind of the main focus is trying to go be Olympic or not Olympic, a uh, world champ at the, in the lightweight single, obviously have to qualify to be sent and then go out there and, you know, compete. Uh, it's in Bulgaria this year. I've never been to Bulgaria. So it's a big change from, you know, the Czech Republic. I've been to the Czech Republic twice, but Bulgaria, that old hat. <laughs> Bulgaria sounds fun. So uh, training for that. Um, and then I think based off of results like that, I can potentially earn uh, an invitation to be part of the senior program again. Um, process is a little bit different than the last year where I was just brought in to the senior program. Uh, because this year is an Olympic qualifying year. So the qualifying year, the top seven uh, boats at senior world champs, so the top seven lightweight doubles qualify for the Olympics. Everybody else doesn't. Uh, and then I guess there's one more opportunity in spring of 2024 to qualify uh, at the last chance regatta where I think it's top two boats go through and qualify for the Olympics. So it's Rowing Canada's focus right now is really qualifying all, the, getting all the boats ready to compete internationally and qualify as many boats as possible. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be a challenge. And I knew that when I decided to kind of pursue this like Olympic dream of mine, but uh, you know, we're, we're working hard and I'm feeling like I'm stronger than ever and more technically competent than ever. Uh, especially if I think about where I was last year. And if I was, I like to think that like, if I was, uh, on par with everybody last year and I'm feeling more confident and better about myself at this point that um, I'm ready to make that next step up but it's going to start with going out to Bulgaria and uh, racing racing my butt off and trying to get some uh, international hardware I've got a lot of this uh, OUA and Canadian national hardware but I 
I'd really like a World Champs stuff uh, to add to the collection. Yeah, and for the record, we will claim you forever, and pretty much any time you do something, we'll still say, you know, she, she's she's one of us. So uh, you'll you'll now be part of the, the social posts when we do. So when your sister's following, um, you'll now be the always a Mustang hashtag on everything you do. So um, uh, yes. we, we we hope that's okay. That's fine. I I have way too much purple <laughs> athletic wear that I think I will start where I will just have to wear it for the rest of my uh, athletic career. Wait, hey, uh, as, uh, if, happy to see some purple, you know, showing up on that uh, that international stage all the time because then we can be like, and it's also easier to pick people out because there's not usually a lot of purple. So you can kind of be no, like, hey, there's one of ours. Well, there's, there's rules. The problem is that there's rules. I only, I'm yeah. only allowed to wear Canada stuff if I'm racing for Canada. So I can wear a purple sports bra, but it can't be shown. I can't show any purple. I can only show Canada stuff. So right. it will always be there. But whether or right. not you're able to see it is uh, will be debatable. But... Yeah, it's all good. We don't we don't want to get you in any trouble. That's not to we're not getting that <laughs> game. So um, most important most importantly, congratulations on uh, on the season um, and finishing it out. I'm sure in what some would say deserving style. I know it's not your your style to think it's deserving style, but um, congratulations on all the wins and, and thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for having me.